speaking of of this, yo, um, you guys, I'm gonna roll right into my next story. You guys are gonna love this. Okay, are you ready for this? This is the exact opposite of what normally happens. Zen Barn Farms buys Cure Leaf cannabis dispensaries in Vermont. Waterbury-based cannabis grower and retailer Zen Barn Farms has signed an agreement to acquire two dispensaries and a growing facility from Cureleaf, a Massachusetts-based cannabis company. The two dispensaries, Vermont Patients Alliance in Montpelier, that's the capital city, and Phytocare Vermont in Bennington, sell THC-based medical cannabis products, and the, and the change of hands comes amid concerns about the future of Vermont's declining medical cannabis industry. It also stands out as a unique instance of a large national cannabis corporation selling assets to a small, locally-owned business, according to Noah Fishman, co-owner of Zen Barn Farms. The company began as a CBD and hemp farm before opening it before opening its THC-based adult-use dispensary last year. Bryn Hare, executive director of the Cannabis Control Board, said the group was excited to see the dispensaries pass over to Vermont ownership. In a quote, nobody was thrilled that the license for Vermont Patients Alliance went out to an out-of-state company, she said. Zembarn plans to close the adult-use side of the Montpelier dispensary, Fishman said, and Cureleaf has also came under scrutiny for uh, alleged ties to Russian billionaire Roman Abramovich, a subject of international sanctions. Authorities in Massachusetts and Connecticut opened investigations into the company after Vice News reported on the connection. And Hare said the control board had been in touch with those states' authorities and found those investigations went nowhere. According to those findings, any ties between Abramovich and Kiraleaf ended before the company entered the Vermont market, and Kiraleaf did not respond to a request for comment before the publication deadline. Hare was not familiar with Kiraleaf's specific reasons for selling, but said, generally speaking, it is pretty hard to maintain a profit when you're a medical dispensary. Patients are uh, pulling out of Vermont's medical cannabis program in favor of simply purchasing products from adult use dispensaries. And Hare said the administrative burden of registering and the narrow set of qualifying conditions seem to be reasons for patients to favor the adult use market. But there are downsides to the dwindling number of patients. If the medical market is not uh, financially viable, certain patients could lose out on cannabis delivery or high THC products that are only available from medical dispensaries, Harris said. A legislative subcommittee had been working on a series of recommendations to help bolster the medical cannabis side of the cannabis market, and Hare said the financial report is expected next week. Zen Barn is not planning to let any of the current employees at the medical dispensaries go, but Fishman admitted that it, that the employees there had been working in an uncertain situation up to this point. He said that the medical market had been overshadowed by the adult use side, but Zen Barn was interested in the holistic wellness benefits of cannabis as part of its mission. Zen Barn also planned to make the growing facility located in Middlesex a world-class example of cannabis cultivation, he said. And the facility is a year-round greenhouse that has natural and artificial light, making it sustainable, he said. It will also use more living soil like a home garden rather than a chemical fertilizers he believes are too common in the industry. Organic certification is not currently available for cannabis products, but Zen Barn still, still tries to follow organic farming practices, Fishman said. And along with its cannabis business, Zen Barn operates a restaurant, studio, and events venue in Waterbury, and Marlena F Fishman, Noah's wife and co-owner of Zen Barn, said the couple's long-term goal is to open up Zen Barn's cannabis business as a workforce development program for growers, retailers, and other Vermont cannabis brands. She called it an opportunity for creative minds and people of diverse backgrounds to come together to work on a new vision of, for Vermont cannabis. And Vermont has a higher than average number of small cannabis growers. Hare said that 70 to 80 percent of grower licenses are considered small cultivators with 1,000 square feet or less of cultivating space. And she said, uh, she said that that could put Vermont into a good position to become well known for its craft cannabis if the drug is federally legalized, but it could 
pose challenges as well, since small growers don't have the same capacity to navigate the state's regulatory system as larger companies. And Noah Fishman said Zen Barn was a community-based company that centered its mission on more than creating wealth. Its focus is on bringing traditional and countercultural cannabis practices and the alternative wellness aspects of the cannabis movement into the modern era. Well, 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 and well. Zen Barn in Vermont. What do you think about this, Yarrow? Cure Leaf selling its assets to a small mom and pop company. So, you know, I've seen some retraction from MSOs in, in various states for various reasons. I've heard the, the motto, stay alive through 25. I don't know what the internal calculus is for Cure Leaf around where they want to maintain an, a presence, expand a presence, or or, or sort of batten down the hatches. Uh, I'm curious. I, I would be curious to know, uh, you know, what wasn't performing and, and why did it make sense for them to, to sell it? Uh, you know, people are like, oh, it's a big win for the little guy because instead of an MSO buying a license, uh, a small uh, entity is buying a license from an MSO. You know, I, I don't know that that's the way we look at wins. I think that sort of falls into our anti-capitalism David and Goliath uh, love story. Uh, but, you know, for 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 dispensaries in the rearview mirror that have sold uh, to larger MSOs uh, with terms that put a lot of money in their pocket, I, I, I don't know that those people would say that the maturation, consolidation and roll up model uh, has been inherently evil for regulated cannabis. Uh, I, I, I love <laughs> that they're talking about living soil and I went to Michigan uh, about a month and a half ago, and I was talking to some farmers in the middle of a place that I've never been, and they were also talking about living soil and organic. And so I like the idea that regulated cannabis has become a uh, a gateway drug to a conversation around sustainability, best agricultural practices. When the guy started talking about how no salt-based nutrients were going to be used, I just thought, how cool is it that these conversations are spreading wider and further and faster and getting more amplified because of regulated cannabis? I thought that was really cool. I also love the thing that they were talking about in terms of education, workforce development, understanding how to grow, cure, uh, product size, and then sell cannabis uh, does have some unique features and attributes, and it makes a lot of sense for everybody who's in the industry to be thinking about how we pass along that information, how we create educational opportunities and centers for people to really learn how to be successful in this industry and understand uh, the plant, the product, and the processes. So uh, I'm not mad at it at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... I... I agree. With you. I'm I'm not mad at it at all. I, I do find it interesting that they're going to do this whole this whole living so soil. And I did not know that there were that many small craft cultivators in Vermont. I found that very very interesting. I did, I was not aware of that that uh, that there is that large of a number of them with cultivating in under a thousand square feet. Um, that that just, I mean that's real small. Yeah, that's real small. It creates a lot of inefficiencies and in a patchwork of small cultivators. And your cost per square foot is for for your cogs and your production and your build out is very high and that's the stuff that doesn't necessarily always pencil but the notion that more people can participate and that we can have small batches of yummy yummy goodness uh does reflect some of the beneficial uh attributes of the 215 model here in california where zoning didn't uh eliminate the ability mm -hmm. for a lot of mom and pop farms to contribute fantastic flour to the supply chain. And that part I like a lot. And I think that th there's something to be said for small batch cannabis. It, it, <laughs> it's not the cheapest way to make cannabis, but one could argue it's the best way to make the highest quality cannabis. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with you on that, Yara. I mean, a lot of the small batch uh, producers, the, those are the generally the people that generally get a higher ticket per uh, per per product uh, on, on top of their their quality tends to be a little bit better and I just remember back in the day when we would when we would have grows whatever was the smaller room generally had had more fire that came out of it and so you know when you get these massive massive thousand light rooms and whatnot it's just just commercial commercial weed and a lot of it isn't isn't amazing it look the the, the hardest thing is on the one hand cannabis is just a plant and people who haven't grown it 
who've grown plants understand that plants grow with similar inputs and, and, and control over certain variables. On the other hand, getting the highest expression out of cannabis is a very, very difficult exercise. And there's an inversely proportional relationship between quality and yield. Mm -hmm. How do you Michelin star a buffet? You can't, it's really, really challenging. Even when we started scaling controlled environment agriculture or indoor cultivation, we knew that sometimes you wanted to take a very big space and break it up into smaller subsections so that you could still sort of get that quality model and also so that you could contain or compartmentalize things that might go wrong like pests. And 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 so I like this 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 cottage cultivator small patchwork of of producers model um because i think it gives people opportunity in the space and you tend like you said to get a better quality of flower um i also am not a big fan of restricting to small canopy in so much as i'd like to see those mom and pop operators who are being successful and are creating great flower the opportunity to expand beyond a thousand square feet just because as you see price compression in a in a, in a maturing market uh, the ability to scale and keep ahead of that uh, is important for those cottage cultivators to be able to make it through uh, the natural market co uh, corrections that we're seeing in less nascent markets. And so uh, I think about that in terms of Mendocino County and the restriction to a 10,000 square foot outdoor permit per parcel and the fact that in one county adjacent and east, the regs were so drastically more per permissive uh, that that cottage cultivators weren't able to compete uh, as biomass mm -hmm. and larger volume became the only way to survive. Yes, and on that, we're going to go to a commercial, and we're going to be right back.